From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! What are the lessons as the nuclear catastrophe there continues to unfold in Japan? Radioactive water is seeping into the sea. Plutonium has been detected in the soil. We host a debate between longtime nuclear opponent Helen Caldicott and British journalist George Mambiot. He's written in favor of nuclear energy after the Fukushima disaster. And then Haiti. The United States has resumed the deportation of Haitians to a country ravaged by an earthquake and cholera. Meanwhile, thousands still live in makeshift camps facing imminent removal. They're being evicted because the person claim, purporting to own the land is saying that he needs to use that part of the land to build another factory for a Chinese company that he has a contract with. They are stuck between a rock and a hard place. They have nowhere else to go. They do not want to be living in these camps, and they have to fight tooth and nail to stay in horrible conditions because they have absolutely nowhere else to go. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Libyan rebels have withdrawn from the town of Ras Lanouf under heavy attack from forces loyal to Muammar Gaddafi. The rebels' pullback follows a series of gains with the aid of U.S.-led airstrikes. The Libyan government continues to claim Western bombs are killing and wounding civilians. On Tuesday, foreign journalists were brought to a hospital in the town of Mizda that Libyan officials claim was damaged by international forces. A nurse at the hospital said she witnessed the attack. We started receiving patients from the outside. A lot of people are injured and wounded, so we heard a very big explosion inside. But we didn't imagine it was the hospital that told us we have to come quickly inside. It was a mess. We couldn't concentrate to receive patients from outside or to bring the patients from inside. When we came, you know, we found this lady already dead and the other two ladies very serious injuries, and we transferred them to Tripoli immediately. At a conference in London, NATO countries agreed to continue the bombing campaign until Gaddafi complies with the U.N. Security Council resolution to stop attacking civilians. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton addressed the gathering. This coalition military action will continue until Gaddafi fully complies with the terms of 1973, ceases his attacks on civilians, pulls his troops back from places they have forcibly entered and allows key services and humanitarian assistance to reach all Libyans. As the Gaddafi regime's counteroffensive intensifies, rebel groups are increasing calls for international military aid. Speaking to ABC News, President Obama said he won't rule out a U.S. military shipment to the rebels. You know, I, I, I wouldn't speculate on that. I think that uh, it's fair to say that uh, if we wanted to get weapons uh, into uh, Libya, we probably could. Uh, we're looking at all our options at this point. While President Obama refused to rule out U.S. military aid, the U.S. commander of NATO left open the prospect of an international force entering Libyan territory. Testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee, Admiral James Stavridis was asked about whether NATO could send ground troops into Libya. I wouldn't say uh, NATO's considering it yet, but I think that when you look at the history of NATO, Having gone through this, as many on this committee have, with uh, Bosnia and Kosovo, it, it's quite clear that um, the possibility of a stabilization regime exists. And so uh, I have not heard any discussion about it yet, but I think that history is in everybody's mind as we look at the events in Libya. Libyan rebels have maintained support for international airstrikes, but have rejected the prospect of an international invasion. A rebel spokesperson in Benghazi said the rebels will overthrow Gaddafi on their own. An alleged victim of rape by Gaddafi's forces remains missing four days after she was arrested for telling her story to international journalists. The woman, Iman al Obaidi, was detained after bursting into a hotel full of reporters in Tripoli and recounting her ordeal. She has not been seen since in public. Obaidi's mother said she was offered bribes to pressure her daughter to recant her accusations. Japan has announced plans to decommission 
Four stricken reactors at the Fukushima nuclear plant. Emergency crews have failed to control reactors one to four since they were damaged in the earthquake and tsunami earlier this month. The announcement comes as seawater near the plant is showing the highest levels of radiation to date. Nuclear safety officials report seawater 300 yards outside contains over 3,000 times the legal limit for the amount of radioactive iodine. Radiation has also seeped into to the soil, produce, raw milk, and even Tokyo's tap water, some 140 miles south of the facility. Meanwhile, the president of the plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, has been admitted to a hospital for hypertension after suffering from dizziness and high blood pressure. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has accepted the resignation of his government following two weeks of protest. Over 60 people have been killed in a wave of rallies calling for political reform. Assad is addressing the protesters in a speech today. At least 53 people have been killed, another 95 wounded in an attack in Iraq's northern city of Tikrit. Gunmen dressed in police uniforms and suicide vests attacked a provincial office and went room to room, executing local politicians and government workers. U.S. forces were deployed to the scene and engaged in combat with the attackers. The dead included Saba Abazi, a 30-year-old freelance photojournalist who worked with the Reuters news agency. A Wisconsin judge has blocked Governor Scott Walker's anti-union law from taking effect for the second time this month. On Tuesday, Dane County Circuit Judge Marianne Sumi reissued a temporary restraining order blocking the bill's implementation. Sumi had earlier ruled Republican lawmakers were likely in violation of state open meeting laws when they pushed the legislation through. Despite the initial ruling, Republicans and some state officials have claimed the measure has taken effect. The Wisconsin State Supreme Court is expected to rule on whether the measure has become law and on whether it can be appealed. Meanwhile, in Ohio, the State House is holding a vote today on a measure that would strip collective bargaining rights for state employees and bar them from striking. Ohio's state Senate passed a harsher version of the bill earlier this month. State lawmakers have removed a provision that would impose jail time as a penalty for taking part in strikes. The Supreme Court has heard oral arguments over an effort to bring a massive class-action sex discrimination lawsuit against the retail giant Walmart. On Tuesday, attorneys for Walmart urged justices to block a group of past and current female workers from filing the case. Plaintiffs and Walmart worker Betty Dukes said she had brought the suit on behalf of the company's women employees across the nation. I brought this case because I believe that there was a pattern of discrimination at Walmart, not just in my store, but I believe it is across the country. Since we have filed our lawsuit since 2001, I have heard from numerous women telling me basically the same story is mine of disparity, uh, treatment, and lack of promotion, as well in lack of pay. The United States Citizenship and Immigration Services has announced it will no longer deny green card applications to married, binational, same-sex couples. The decision means binational LGBT couples with recognized marriages will now be able to apply for citizenship while Congress decides whether to repeal or modify the Defense of Marriage Act. Clashes continue in the Ivory Coast between forces loyal to incumbent President Laurent Gbagbo and the internationally recognized election winner Alassane Ouattara. Anti-Bagbo forces have captured a number of strategic towns on the nation's eastern and western fronts. The United Nations, meanwhile, is accusing forces loyal to Bagbo of killing a dozen people in the city of Abidjan Monday. Over one million people are said to have fled Abidjan since the conflict began. Melissa Fleming of the U.N.'s High Commissioner for Refugees Office said aid agencies are preparing for a flood of refugees to neighboring Ghana. We are um, bracing for significant arrivals in Ghana should the situation in Abidjan get worse. Um, it, there has been a, a, a jump. There are um, over 3,000 refugees who have come into Ghana so far. And also um, in countries like Togo, Burkina Faso, uh, we are also preparing uh, for new arrivals.
And federal investigators are reportedly reviewing whether managers for the oil giant BP could face manslaughter charges in connection with last year's Gulf oil spill disaster that left 11 people dead. Bloomberg News reports investigators are also reviewing statements from company officials at congressional hearings following the spill to determine whether their claims match what they knew. BP's former chief executive officer, Tony Hayward, is reportedly among those under investigation. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman.